Hi, everybody. Welcome to CCA Design Features Lab. Uh, today, we're here with our panelists, and I'll let Helen Maria take it away for our introductions. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're delighted to be here in cyberspace. Um, I'm Helen Maria Nugent, and I'm the Dean of Design at California College of the Arts, which is in San Francisco and Oakland, California. Um, CCA, for those of you who don't know, if you're joining from somewhere else in the world, we're a 113-year-old independent school of art design and architecture committed to environmental responsibility, community engagement, and social justice. So just a few words uh, about the design division and why we're hosting this event. So design division at CCA has uh, six undergraduate programs and three graduate programs. And this event is being hosted by our Design Futures Lab, which is a new incarnation in our MFA design program. Um, and we strive to be a sanctuary for advancing design research and practice where wonder and imagination are amplified through vigor and craft. So we're delighted to be part of the newly launched uh, virtual SF Design Week, I guess the first one ever. Um, and we're really excited uh, and thankful for everyone at SF Design Week for managing this massive pivot onto online space, which we know is going to allow many, many more people to participate in our event and learn about our Futures Lab activities. I want to give a quick shout out to some people that you see on the screen, um, Kimberly McDonald and Sarah Nefta for actually helping us with all of the work here. And a shout out to Chris Hamamoto for this incredible uh, graphic design work and our branding work. Um, and also for helping us build the CCE Design Features Lab website, which is going to go live uh, a little later this summer. So look out for that. And considering this year's theme of intentional distortions, we focus on the task of intentionally challenging and altering our thinking. To imagine what could be as a large part of what we do as designers, as strategists, and as futurists. But how do we do this? Um, and how do we as educators, all of us here are educators too, um, how do we teach others how to do this and, uh, or to help our teams develop this way of thinking? So today's panel is here to help you do that. Uh, design, design prompts, strategies, and tactics to expand your thinking. And we've got four incredible speakers here. Uh, I want to quickly introduce them. Uh, so each presenter is going to present for about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, that will give us about 10 minutes at the end for um, a quick wrap up and hopefully a couple of questions from the uh, Q&A. I would really love you to think about what questions you could ask the entire panel. And Kimberly is going to help us pull a couple of those questions and uh, present them live. So first up today, um, we're going to have Sarah Dean. Uh, who is the assistant chair of the MFA design program and the head of the C CCA Futures Lab. Oh, I was actually going to, I was going to share my screen. I'll do that right now. Two seconds. Oh, sorry about that. Oops, it won't let me share right now. Let's try this. How about that? Yeah, so actually, first up, we have Sarah Dean, who is the assistant chair of the MFA design program and the head of CCA Futures Lab. Can you give us a wave, Sarah? Uh, she's a designer and architect, a co-founder of If Then Studio, a collaborative community platform in Berkeley. She's also the chief designer at Modern Empathy, a universal design line of homes. Uh, she's committed to open access data and crowd production. Our next panelist will be Nathan Shedroff, who's the executive director of Seed Vault Limited, an independent trusted bot economy on the blockchain. Nathan actually founded and chaired the groundbreaking design MBA program here at California College of the Arts, and he's a perfect, prolific writer and speaker and has written many books, um, including uh, Design is the Problem and Design Strategy in Action. Our third presenter is going to be Forrest Young. He's a global principal at Wolf Owens, recently, recently named Fast Company's most innovative company for design. And his clients are the big names, Apple, Twitter, and Modern Fertility. On the education side, he's an MFA senior critic in graphic design at Yale School of Art. And he's also, luckily for us, an adjunct professor at CCA, where he envisioned and taught the inaugural MFA design course in Futures Design. 
And then we're going to wrap up. Our final presenter is going to be Scott Miniman, uh, who is an innovative technologist inventing, designing, engineering, fabricating, and exhibiting uh, interactive devices for public spaces. He was a researcher at uh, Xerox Park um, for 15 years, and then co-founded Onomy Labs, uh, who make, who is, which is a, a make tank. Love that term for hands-on interactive. Um, they have designed exhibitions all over the world, from Mexico City to Singapore to right home here in San Francisco at the Exploratorium. Um, so I want to give a huge shout out to my panelists. I'm excited for all of your presentations today. And um, if I can actually, I'll stop sharing my screen and I want to turn it over to our first panelist. Thank you, Sarah. See you all soon. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Sarah. Um, so the tactic I'm going to talk to you today about, um, I'm calling uh, trim tabbing. And uh, this comes from um, from many sources, but Buckminster Fuller, who talks about the trim tab in relation to personal agency. He says, um, something hit me very hard once, thinking about what one little man could do. Think of the Queen Mary, the whole ship goes by and then comes the rudder. And there's a tiny thing at the end of the rudder called the trim tab. It's a miniature rudder, just moving a little trim tab, builds a low pressure that pulls the rudder around takes almost no effort at all. So I said that that little individual can be the trim tab. The fact is that you just put your foot out like that and the whole big ship of state is going to go. So I said, call me trim tab. And this is actually uh, his headstone where that's the quote he decided to use. Um, and then I'm gonna put this in terms of design agency and add one more idea to this, which is Danella Meadows leverage points within a system. And so this is her list of uh, points of agency in a system listed by their impact. And often when we talk about design, we're really talking at these low level interventions, changes in aesthetic qualities and efficiencies and features, inputs, outputs, flows. Uh, but these top four items here, changing the rules of a system, self-organizing, changing its goals, even changing its paradigm and how it's operating are where we're gonna focus instead. These are the trim tabs where a small change can have enormous uh, systemic agency. And so I'm gonna use three kind of in the news examples to try to pull out this point and start to visualize how we can see these moments either happening in things around us or ideally uh, embedding them in our own work. Um, so this is a recent story from earlier, I guess maybe last year. Um, a California man got a custom license plate reading null, hoping to not be able to get a ticket as the plate would appear as a null value in the plate recognition database. So instead, when he did get a ticket, if the plate was automatically associated with all null values in the set and was attached to thousands of tickets. And he got a bill in the mail for $12,000. So this was an intervention that worked within the system. It was designed to work within, but in an unintentional direction. It was a trim, tr trim tab, but in this case, working in uh, the wrong direction. And here's another one from a few years back, uh, working on the same system. Um, this license plate puts a drop database line of code uh, in, the, in the license plate recognition database, intending to erase the whole database when the plate is added to it. And so I'm using these two license plate examples for the, you know, first of all, because it's a very benign, neutral, you know, um, abstract system and these are moments of personal agency within them and a way of thinking in general about not opting out of a system or or thinking of hacking a system even but finding uh open opportunities within it that can have greater agency 
um, upstream. And here's one more from uh, more recent news. So this trim tab moment is from the uh, Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, K-pop stands um, banded together and co-opted the hashtags white lives matter and blue lives matter as a political protest. They in effect shut down these hashtags on Twitter by flooding them with fan pics. And so again, instead of working outside of the system or allowing this to this white lives matters hashtag to operate on its own, they found a moment of political agency in a way that the that the system allowed. That Twitter Twitter likes noise. Twitter likes hashtags, and so they found a way to use that as a leverage point for collective action. So I'm going to quickly look at one of my recent projects uh, through this lens. Uh, this is a project that my studio. If Then has been developing, and it was exhibited at the uh, Shenzhen uh, Biennale uh, earlier this year. So we were working on the question of the housing crisis in the Bay Area, and a question of how to build more affordable housing and aid the efforts to stop displacement in neighborhoods. And so as we know, Airbnb is a large actor in this space. It adds to unaffordable housing, evictions, and displacement, and it's increasingly used as a development tool for commercial short-term housing within residential neighborhoods. So uh, we're talking about a system that's being often used to extract value from a neighborhood and moving it into the tourist economy. And so the question that we're asking is, how could our personal agency impact this large international economy uh, in any other way than opting out? How can we be in it and, uh, and working towards other ends, new goals? Uh, where are the leverage points or trim tab moments uh, located in this commercial space? And how could Airbnb and companies like it work as an engine to build community equity rather than extract it? So this led to another seemingly simple observation. In the Bay Area, we are often housing vulnerable populations in trailers and sheds and housing tourists in long-term houses. So this project instead makes pop-up structures for tourists, which raises money for affordable housing and other community uh, needed development. The system works within Airbnb as it is now without any changes. It can be used on existing rooms and apartments also, along with these pop-up uh, cabins, diverting money raised into a community fund. And so again, we're not looking to hack the system or operate outside of it, um, but instead we're just looking for aspects intrinsically naturally part of the Airbnb ecosystem uh, that have potential to be diverted to affordable housing in this case or other goals. And this project learns from a, a great oldie but goodie project. Um, when Google Ads first came out, an artist group set up a site that used revenue from Google Ads uh, on their site to buy Google stock. They created a network of sites that agreed to do the same thing. And Google basically in this project was paying them through Google ad revenue to buy Google. So the project is called uh, Google Will Eat Itself, and it's still searchable online if you want to look it up. So this is an ingenious trim tab. Uh, it uses the Google Ads economy to raise money through views and click-throughs, just as it was intended. And then it diverts those funds into Google stock. So it imagines through the project, through design, Google as a collective ownership model over time through Google's own capital. It's a trim tab, a tiny one in a mammoth system. And so in our case, our trim tab is a house that builds housing. Uh, the commons place makes money through tourist housing. Part of that is used to make more housing, proliferating the system. And another part goes to a community resource chest that can be used for emergency housing funds or affordable units or even potentially new cooperative housing developments. Uh, and a trim tab. Uh, in this way is diverting money uh, off of the main thread, uh, ruddering it over 
um, from personal gain to community gain. So for the Biennale, we proposed pop-up housing that could be rented for any donation amount uh, adjacent to the to the Biennale site, which was the um, Shenzhen uh, train station. These would raise money for more houses and would proliferate through the course of the Biennale. Um, and then afterwards could be distributed to other locations, community galleries and neighborhoods uh, locally. Um, if you'd like to help with this project or that you know of a community organization that you think would be interested in using it, contact me or email us through the website. So uh, design objects are often seen as downstream touch points of large so social, economic, and technology infrastructure, demonstrating the powers of the, the system rather than impacting or changing it. But design has the ability to, uh, to add personal and collective agency also changing the social, economic, or political dynamics of a system. I wanna urge you as designers to seek out these trim tab moments, which allow you to expose or reimagine the systems you're working in and create more upstream consequences through design. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm next here. I'm gonna talk about two things today uh, because I think that uh, designers struggle with trying to uh, embody both leadership and, and strategy and find their way into becoming more influential uh, uh, leaders of design and making design uh, more strategic in their lives and, and the work that they do. We don't usually get taught leadership and uh, strategy in design programs, certainly not at an uh, undergraduate level. Uh, but in the MDES program, in which I teach at CCA, the uh, Masters of Design and Interaction Design, we make a point to teach design leadership and design strategy um, in a very particular way and, and somewhat of a unique way. Um, so I want to start with this uh, definition of leadership, which comes out of neuro-linguistic programming. I actually learned it in the MBA program that uh, I, when I earned my MBA, um, because I think it's the most helpful as well as the most clear definition of what leadership is. Leadership is the clear communication of a future or a future vision others want to follow. And if we understand that fully, we realize that leadership has nothing to do with authority. That's a certain kind of leadership called a uh, hard power usually. But that if you can clearly communicate a vision that others want to follow, you can be a leader regardless of where you are. And we have tons of examples throughout history of people leading obviously from the top of an organization or from the bottom of an organization, someone like Norma Ray comes to mind, from the middle of an organization, or even from, the, from outside the organization or outside the system, someone like Martin Luther King Jr., who was not part of the government and yet became an incredible leadership a uh, incredible leader of change within the government uh, and within society. So if we can understand this and break it up a bit, all of us as designers are in a really good position to become leaders. In fact, in a really great position. Because when we break down this definition, we find, find design everywhere. So clear communication. You can't be a leader unless you can clearly communicate. And that's exactly what design is about. Um, it's not only about clarity, but a good chunk of design is about communicating clearly. If we look at the idea of future, this is where strategic foresight comes in. If we can create uh, uh, a vision of the future, whether it's a future product or a future uh, service or something else entirely like policy or events or places, then we can communicate that such that people will understand what it is and then this last piece, this idea that others want to follow, is informed by what is now called design, how we teach design today, not how we taught design in my time. Um, and this is what design research is for, because it allows us to understand and empathize with the people we are designing for, whether they're users or um, constituents or citizens or someone else entirely, um, and whether we're co-designing with them or for them, um, we need to understand what it is that uh, appeals to them, what they need, what they want, 
uh, not just on a level of features or price, but on a level of emotions and value and meaning. So design is all over this definition and we, uh, as designers, could easily walk into leadership roles simply by plugging in our skills in the right places. The second thing I want to talk about is this idea of strategy, because strategy is poorly understood, and certainly within a lot of the design community, but actually, m mostly within the business community who, who learn strategy in all the wrong ways. Um, uh, I see I have a typo there. Traditional strategy is limited and it's linear, and this is how it's practiced. It shouldn't be this way, it just is that way. So often, business strategy is done in a kind of haphazard way. People start with one piece and they jump to another piece and then they jump to another piece. And it's almost entirely informed only with quantitative research. And quantitative data is valuable. It tells us a lot about what's going on in the world. It's, it's a key way of understanding the what. But it almost never, it's almost impossible for quantitative research to tell us the why. And we cannot enliven people's lives. We cannot improve the world. We cannot do all the things that we want to accomplish as designers without understanding the why. The other problem with this linear idea of strategy is that it's, it's sort of one and done. People, companies, organizations work on their strategic plan. And it, maybe they do it every three to five years, but they literally drop it once it's done. They, they poorly communicate it, even within the rest of their organization. And then it just sort of goes away until the next time we decide that we want to do it. And this kind of strategy limits us as designers from not only being involved and helping to drive the process, but it downplays the value of our work. So I want to give you a different model of strategy, one that's more realistic, one that's more designerly, and one that's more valuable. And that is that strategy is circular and it's continuous. It's always happening. Everything that an organization does, whether it's your own company or your client, is embodying strategy or not. And if we use both quantitative research and qualitative research, the why and the what, then we imbue our strategy with the very values that we hold as designers and allow us to then create the best value we can for the people that we design for. It takes a specific process, a sequence that builds upon itself so that the output of one process becomes the input of the other. And then even when our sort of strategic plan is finished, every activity that we do as a, a worker, whether it's on the design side or the management side or the employee side, is either uh, supporting that strategy or undermining that strategy. And so I want to give you a couple quick examples of some of the tools that, if you approach st strategy in this way, um, can play out tactically and support strategy uh, at every step of your activities. The other thing I'll note here, there's a little uh, uh, loop here down at the bottom. It's sort of in gray. It's a little hard to see. And that is that even though strategy is continuous and that we need to build with the context that we work and design in, Every now and then, we need to look further forward than we normally do, and that's where that foresight comes from. We set a vision, and hopefully if we understand our employees and our customers and our constituents well, we set a vision where they want to go. And then they just adopt the vision that, you have, uh, that we have created as designers, and away you go. So with better strategy and better research, we create better insights and ultimately we identify better opportunities. This is why designers are fundamentally in the, have the right skill set become, to become leaders, not just of the design function within an organization, but the whole organization. So what are some things that you can do about it? Well, you can learn about strategy and practice it on your own. You can learn about the vocabulary and, and frames that our peers use because we need to be the translators again. We also need to build relationships within our client organizations and our own organizations so that the, the very valuable information that we understand about the market and customers is available to them um, uh, when strategy is created. We need to uh, create the conditions to be invited into the strategic process because usually we are not. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead here a little bit. The other thing is we need to take the, the tools that we use, common things like personas, 
um, and, and make them more strategic, make them more continuous, and essentially make them more living. And so there's a company, my colleague has a company called Scansion, where they have living personas that they're constantly updating their persona in a real time uh, way with new data about what's going on in that market segment. And so everyone in the company can, can consult and say, what's Emily interested in now? How's Emily's life changing with the situations uh, that are happening out there in the world? And the answers are already there without waiting until the next design cycle. One uh, more thing that all uh, looks like uh, it's waiting for something. Um, one last tactic I'll leave you with, uh, which sounds a little weird and I'm designing, it's very managery. Um, and that is when I, uh, when we started the DMBA program and I had to put, for, uh, prepare a budget every year, I built in the five strategies of CCA right into my spreadsheet, into my budget. And every single line item in my budget was color coded to one of the five or more than one of the five strategies because I wanted the administration to know that not only was I thinking at this level how to accomplish the organization's strategies, but how what I was doing was contributing or not contributing to that. And so if, if one of these items doesn't fit any of the strategies, that's a really good um, uh, uh, reasoning for maybe it doesn't need to, we don't need to spend money there. But if another item contributes very heavily to one or more, that's your uh, backup when someone wants to come in and cut your budget. So I'll leave you with that. There's plenty more tools uh, that, um, we can make use of. Um, I will, uh, uh, one, one thing that I'll suggest is if you go to my website, nathan.com, I list a lot of these tools uh, and a lot of new tools like stakeholder engagement and uh, social impact analysis where you might find out more information about how to, how to become more strategic and how to become a better leader. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. I will share a screen now. So first, I just wanted to thank everyone for, for being here. Uh, it's incredibly important um, for me that I have uh, human beings to, to talk to about a lot of these, these tools and great perspectives that have already been shared. The name of my talk is called Auto Reverse, and I think specifically, I wanted to meditate on the times that we're in, and specifically to assess the tools that brought us to this moment. Um, what about our tools? Um, are viable? What about our tools? Um, should we improve? Um, what's wrong about our perspectives that we hold when we're thinking about futures? And how can we reverse those that are bad? I've always been enamored by this idea um, and then perplexed at times that progress had a direction. I think these old media metaphors, the era of physical media, cassette tapes, where we started to uh, give meaning, but also to imbue direction with a sense of value. What do we mean by this? And looking at the 40th anniversary of the Sony Walkman, um, a younger version of myself as a designer would say, um, the 40 is running in the wrong direction, it's running to the left. And realizing that I had these uh, implicit biases in terms of how I actually ascribe meaning and value to direction. We can think of, you know, sinister is of the left and dexter is of the right, recto and verso. Our physical world is coded uh, by how we judge uh, meaning relative to where we're going and how we're looking. I was mortified to know that the word stereotype actually harkens back to the eras of letterpress, where, where more efficient ways of creating book plates, uh, which were called stereotypes, were used to create um, both the rectos and the versos simultaneously, alleviating the letterpress from having to manually set metable movable type. So to think about this idea that stereotype has a design origin is problematic, but it's also inspiring because of these, these things or these terms that come from our profession ultimately should galvanize us to push forward and to improve upon the things that need improving. And thinking about stereotype, it got me thinking about stereo everything, stereo symbols, um, uh, type in stereo. And I was 
interested by the fact that at one point in time, we had competing play buttons. We had play button that was synonymous with sound, which of course became the volume button. We had play that was synonymous with music. It was a 16th note moving forward. Um, we couldn't agree on what was the button that should be called play. We arrived at this uh, right pointing arrow. And I found it interesting that ultimately the arrow is a relatively recent uh, symbol. Going back to 1737, uh, perhaps more interesting is that we press a button that harkens back to a weapon of war when we want to advance something, which says a lot about the types of symbols that we value and that we have to navigate our devices and our worlds. And a shout out to Xerox Park. When we think about 1973, the year that, the year that stereo symbols became an agreed upon standard, it was also the, the year that we were being exposed to the transformational graphical user interface, 100 years after we were introduced to the Remington II, which forever um, you know, um, imbued a sense of typing was always going to be confined to the, the QWERTY standard, right? the QWERTY keyboard that we can't seem to move away from. For much of last year leading up to this year, uh, everything was about moving and fast forward. It was about running to the next thing, sprinting, and maybe that it was uh, mildly unsustainable as we rushed to think about blended realities. Um, you know, a reality at hand that was unfiltered, how we could augment that uh, with um, illusory things that might be helpful or escapist, virtual and immersive realities. Uh, my personal favorite, diminished reality, which is a contemplation on the things that designers could remove that a design brief isn't always about adding. But here we are at this particular standstill as we look at our livelihood set against the backdrop of this uh, incendiary but timely um, you know, civil rights movement alongside a global and persistent pandemic. And it's at this moment where I think we have to evaluate the tools that brought us here, the inputs that a lot of us in future thinking um, have, um, PESTL, formerly known as PEST, where we have political, economic, sociocultural, technological, ecological, and legal considerations um, that we use to bring into uh, a projection of a future that we're trying to bring about, uh, the familiar Boros cone. If we imagine ourselves at the, the tip of that cone and we're looking out into the future, um, we see that there's an inevitable, probable future that for many of us feels um, unsatisfactory. So we look at a larger diameter that's the, the plausible realm and even larger, uh, the realm of possibility. And for many of us, our design brief is simply to look at that, uh, that white uh, spotlight, uh, which we call the preferable future. Um, we look at something that'd be more advantageous uh, to more people. Um, what's clear as we look around the world right now, um, that these tools may have been flawed, the inputs may have been misguided, and it's a preferable future to whom? Who is wielding this flashlight moving forward? And so I became reassured by an old uh, technological invention called auto reverse. When I thought back to my days of holding physical media and cassette tapes like a Sony Walkman. Auto reverse was something that uh, I felt reassured by because it reminded me of this, uh, this ancient riddle, uh, this, this quone where you have uh, an elephant that's being encountered by six blind monks. And each of the blind monks is enthralled and fascinated by a particular aspect of the elephant. Um, there's a monk that's holding on to the tusk and the, saying, oh, this is a spear. One's holding on to the back and saying it's a giant boulder. One's saying it's a tail. And we realize that the elephant itself is unknowable and it's specifically unknowable as they argue about uh, which one is right. The elephant in many ways um, is not unlike a Necker cube. It's a multi-stable image. And as I think about multi-stability and some of my favorite pieces of design, like this Man Ray um, underground cover, where he spins London underground logo to create Saturn, which of course reminds me of Sun Ra and his infatuation with Saturn and his insistence that he was a citizen of Saturn who just came uh, to Earth uh, to help elevate the consciousness. Now many look at Sun Ra um, with a certain degree of amusement. This is actually quite relevant for futures thinking because Sun Ra was choosing to look backwards and to say, why should I accept and inherit the histories that have been provided for me that have been limited by bias and racism? Can I choose to imagine my origin story as I look forward to imagine um, a future that benefits all? So here we have a bi-directional Boros cone. We're looking at reimagining our origin story and the inputs themselves, as well as the future we look to bring about. 
And I think for many of us, we should look at this as our last chance to design a future that's inclusive, a future that gives people hope that they have a place um, in society um, that feels nourishing and encouraging. And if you forgot everything that I've said, just remember what the one snail said to the other snail. I don't care if she's a tape dispenser. I love her. So with that, thank you. That's great. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So I'm the cleanup speaker, feeling like I want to respond to all the other position statements, but knowing that there's already too much in this deck and have to just speed through it. I'm kind of going to be drawing on wearing three hats today, but mainly co focusing on two. One is being kind of the misfit designer at a futures forecasting organization and the other being a misfit one of the misfit futurists at a design school and when you do that you're you're always kind of an outlier and you find yourself playing against the uh, stereotypes and commonly held misconceptions about your practice but there's actually a great deal of rigor in the practice of forecasting and organizations of all stripes find it valuable. There are ways of visualizing and thinking about what futurists do. And Forrest was kind enough to introduce this particular figure of the, how we think about the future. We also think about what we can expect from the practice in terms of rates of change how things play out over time, and how new modes of culture and technology switch from one to another. And rigorous ways to make sure you're not being overly optimistic or pessimistic or blind to possibilities. In the time frame we're most engaged with at the Institute for the Future, kind of like the next decade, and in terms of how I like to work to future-proof our CCA students. This quote captures the core of an approach, looking for pockets of the future embedded in the present and then extrapolating them. But keep front of mind that the future is combinatoric. Changes don't happen in isolation and they intersect. This cartoon from Popular Science Magazine in the late 60s depicting the wonders of vinyl upholstery was wrong, not just in the forecast of spraying down your living room, but also in the depiction of the future home. Same furnishings, an ashtray, the clothing, the hair, the gender role. We could spend a fair amount of time picking apart this particular image, but it illustrates how uh, when you're thinking about the future, you have to think about multiple chain change vectors at once. Bringing these two practices together has a few built-in challenges. Design thinking, aiming for an intervention, is, tends to be kind of inherently reductive, where future thinking is fundamentally expansive. Futurists tend to deliver provocative ways of thinking, vectors of change, foundational technology shifts, demographic transitions, many signaled again by pockets of the future existing in the now. Forecasters create maps and infographics to lend structure to the foresight and help stakeholders wrap their heads around possibilities. But I'm sort of attached to this assertion about the relationship between design and the future. When Alan Kay worked at Xerox Park in the early 70s, he created a mock-up of something he coined the Dynabook which has a pretty close relation and rendition to what became today's laptop. And we see this happening a lot, this kind of uh, glimpses of the future, you know, thanks to Nathan and Chris, who I think are in the audience, Make It So is a fantastic resource about how we doggedly 
work to create things we read about and saw in science fiction. And obviously CCA and IFTF both engage in this practice of making things into existence. <clears throat> Many documentaries about the future, scenarios, artifacts from the future that create curiosity and wonder and a little apprehension at all different sizes and scales. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time remaining minutes on three quick examples. One comes from an IFTF-sponsored studio project that explored the conceptual notion of actionable matter, which could be thought of as extreme Internet of Things. The second is a th summer project I tackled with uh, CCA intern Yufan Jiang that um, exhaustively illustrated one of the conceptual frameworks uh, that we had developed at IFTF. And the final one um, is a glimpse at some client work that foregrounded storytelling using physical objects and scenarios to create a compelling version of how changes might play out. So the button, undertaken as a CCA studio project in that sponsored studio, looked at a really, the kind of the most minimal interaction design user experience action, a single button press, and asked what outcomes that might trigger in, a, in an imagined future. Um, Ricky here can, created a button to confirm orders when online shopping with conversational computing. She found it was too easy to spend lots of money without thinking, without time to consider, without recourse. So she created this physical confirm button but the button could be instilled with values and goals. So spending a lot of money could be difficult, requiring a lot of force on the button, or it requ could require a time investment, like a lot of uh, dwell on the button, or it could give feedback about the wisdom of a purchase using colored light and haptics. Apparently, all sorts of problems, people have problems with this issue, buying things on impulse, the project, while having a kind of UX and branding spin, quickly expands into very interesting interaction design issues around designing and parameterizing all these different input and output factors, even with just a simple button. Other pro cool projects came out of that same assignment, an espresso-like one-touch system for injecting heirloom flavors into synthetic food balls, and a bunch of others that, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over. The Trust Objects project that you found and I did was systematically used high-fidelity prototyping, actually functional in many cases, to make, a to, to make and illustrate a conceptual framework about how we might trust in the future and how those things that we... Uh, interact with um, and that framework that had been developed at the Institute could be touched and held and experienced and debated. Abstract con tactics like outsourcing trust, filtering untrustworthy information, community-based trust, and continuous verification were made into tangible experiences. We made these objects created illustrative videos and interactive exhibits, and engaged with event attendees about their role and function. Helen Maria acted as a guest critic for a session that was a design review of the, the collection of objects. The Biospots are a collection of conversational computing objects that announce their values right up front. The Sustainabot, depicted on the right, is a menagerie that keeps kids amused and parents honest about their in-home sustainability behaviors. The PayPal pal at the left in the big shot gives answers that are aligned with the doctrine of the Catholic Church. These other high resolution examples I'm going to um, skip over, uh, but they'll be available in the deck and they're available on the Institute for the Futures website, um, but this this one used continuous verification to make sure our food was safe. This one 
outsourced our social media posting and uh, guiding on uh, vacations. Um, this one made young skateboarders safe uh, when they went out into the world. And finally, I wanted to just touch on um, client work. Uh, in virtual, oops. Virtual Gets Real looked at a variety of form factors that might replace the cell phone. And here we use specific settings and demographics to explore specific modalities and functions. Um, and one of the five scenarios, and I'm going to start this playing and then talk over the top of it. Um, uh, so this one looked at a social robot, an independent living companion for the elderly. It mapped out a story about this intervention, how Fido functioned Longer life expectancy over the course of the day. Skip forward to In where some we countries, have to get into the scenario. What do we have here? Hi, Fred. We have here. Sorry. Oh, what do we have here? Um, so we mapped out this story about how Fido functioned over the course of a day, and it forced us to resolve many of the issues that might otherwise made an intervention seem impractical. We did five of these highly differentiated technologies, always focusing on retaining a social component to the scenario and keeping them all real, be it uh, mixed reality eyewear, screen-based Augmented oh, reality, projected augmented here. reality, Do you like or collaborative holographic to touch surfaces. Thanks for getting the storytelling, so though, was key because it illustrated how these uh, future devices could so be um, lived experiences. Great. He's figured out my routines and keeps me from forgetting. I'm going to cut this off <laughs> and just go to a final slide. So I hope this lightning presentation highlights various tactics I've been using to engage the future, embracing the complexity of the future while still looking for straightforward ways to have our students be future ready, uh, making the future rigorous and real with provocative prototypes and hands-on experiences, and finally working with the storytelling angle to make futures that are believable and ultimately futures we want to actually live in. With that, I will stop sharing. Cool. Thank you all. If maybe you could pop your videos back on, that would be great. Wow, that was lightning fast that we went through all of those. I know there's many, many, many questions are in the chat. But maybe I can just say one word and then I've got I've pulled a couple of the questions um, that we can ask you. So, um, you know, to start with, Sarah's amazing tactics of the trim tabs that's such an interesting idea and designers being really active agents in the system at that mo at moments that can actually create change. Um, Nathan uh, presenting the idea of really understanding, equally understanding the whys and the whats and thinking about it as a, a constant evolution that's a really wonderful way for us to think about strategy. And Forest Auto Reverse, yeah I love that tape deck as soon as that came into my life, I was right there. Um, and I also really love the idea of um, how that future cone can go backwards, you know, and thinking about how, depending upon how we think about our past, our future is utterly different. And that's a really critical thing to think about right now. And Scott, so many amazing ideas in there. Um, but I think that last one that you ended with is our, our, our purpose as designers to make sure that what we're designing and thinking about is actually things that we would want to see and make happen, but also the potential for us to create uh, speculations that allow us to think deeply and react in ways that allow us to not do things that we don't want to do that's really critical. So I guess the first question that sort of pulls together from all the um, audience is, you know, we're witnessing these two massive global shifts. We can't, you know, we have to put that in front of us, a pandemic and, a, and an uprising that's been a long time coming. It's really a moment of radical change and I think we all want to know what part we can play and what our role is in the future. But a question is, I mean, is, is every designer a futures designer, right? You know, design is about enacting things and putting things into the world that are not yet 
here or changing the things that are already here. So a question that we have coming in is, well, if all of you could briefly answer, what piece of advice or action would you, can, can, can our audience have right now in order to influence positive, cha positive change and to be a part of building a better future? What would you say that they could do to become futures designers? You can jump in. I can take, I can take the, take, I can jump in um, out of Sesame Street over here, me and Oscar the Grouch. Um, I think the, one of the things that's always been a helpful reminder uh, as, as a designer is what is my individual commitment to Scott's point of being able to imagine a future that I'd want to inhabit. I think it's a very simple thing, but I think we're all responsible for using the tools that we have to be able to create a future that we can imagine. And if we can't imagine it, um, then we have to look and examine the barriers to why don't I see myself in this, in this profession, in this society, um, you know, walking home, feeling safety. And um, many of you are familiar with my story that I had mistakenly thought that Paul Rand was an African-American because I saw a bad, a bad photo of him. It was like an overexposed photo. And so I had this whole misguided understanding that Paul Rand was an African-American and just led me all the way to graduate school. And I was like, oh no, Paul Rand is this amazing black guy. And uh, it was because I couldn't imagine going to this profession without having some type of historical figure. And it turns out that he wasn't African-American, but that I needed that type of bridge. And so I think it's interesting whether you manufacture it or whether you need to find your heroes and seek them out, you can create a personal bridge to the future that you want to create. That's, that's a great story for us. I'd never heard of that, by the way. Uh, the thing I, I'm going to suggest that we do as designers is incredible. It's going to sound overly simplified, but that's simply just to listen. We need to listen to others that have different experiences. We obviously need to listen to our customers or our users or our constituents, citizens, but we, we specifically need to listen to people who don't have the same experiences haven't gone through the same, you know, experiences, have the same skills, dare I say, have the, the same privileges that we do. Because if we want to create a future, um, it not only needs to be our future. You know, when I went to design school, we were essentially trained to go redesign everything in the world in our image, right? Like a Werner Panton uh, with our own style. And that the world would love it, and of course the world sort of didn't love it. Um, Design today is about designing experiences for other people, not just for our portfolios, not just for ourselves. And we just can't do that without listening. I'll also add that we need to listen to nature. We need to listen to the future that is trying to talk to us or the many futures that are trying to talk to us. And we just need to listen to it all before we decide where, what we want to do with what we learn. Yeah, I'll jump in also. Um, so I'll, I, I second both of those, so I'll add something different, which is, um, you know, the structure of the present is made to feel inevitable, um, but it was a process of power structures and also improbability and, and luck, right? There's a lot that we ended up with that was not designed to be this way, but the, the, so the important thing to do in order to make change is to question what feels neutral and what feels inevitable about now and then wonder why it is that way and wonder how you want it to be. And um, I would say to do this, one is to find the power position you already have and that might be a skill and that might be a, posi an, a, a job position, that might be um, what you look like in the world, that there's a lot of things that are, uh, you know, unique power positions that you have. And then similarly, not see that as neutral and instead ask, how, how did that happen and how can I use it to, um, to bring up those around me? Um, one of the things that I really try to live by is we all, we all will succeed together and otherwise none of us have, right? And so, to also look around and, and try to locate those points. Again, like moments of agency um, in things that have made to feel out of our control and inevitable and neutral and outside of us. And a lot of a lot of what I was 
initially going to say has now been covered, but but I was uh, I did want to kind of underscore um, two things. One one part uh, comes from that futures cone that um, that Forrest put up, and I repeated. You know how we get to preferred futures is something. It's a process that we have to be kind of constantly engaged with, and looking at the unintended consequences of things like we can't as designers think that we got it right and just kind of put things into the world and then, you know, then it's out of our control. We need to kind of constantly be maintaining them. And it kind of relates to Sarah's trim tab thing. We kind of like got to keep steering this ship and take design has the opportunity to take a, a really active role in that. Um, and, you know, Related to Sarah's point as well, the kind of what muscle we 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 have a kind of short amount of time on this planet, and we should be spending our time wisely. Um, so, looking for what muscle can we flex in any particular moment, and how can we keep steering uh, the path to preferable futures and away from both the inevitable and some of the disasters that lurk out there in the future. Great, thank you. Those are all wonderful answers. Um, there's a, a, a sort of related question that has reached up to the top. Um, and obviously our Design Futures Lab, a lot of the work, uh, um, especially, you know, you showed, Scott, some of it, but obviously when we're in school, we're not only thinking about, um, you know, looking at the issues that we have in the world and trying to problem solve around them. We're also really trying to give space for students to explore and examine and speculate, right? Sometimes reaching uh, conclusions that are uh, that can be very provocative. Um, and so there's a question that relates to that, which is how, maybe if anyone has a thought on what is the intersection or the potential intersection of the sort of design work that we see in futures, speculative design, with the really on the ground, participatory, public, engaged, um, the sort of the movements that are happening now uh, that are that are about the recent like recent protests, right? There's real action and engagement happening there. How do we intersect that with some of this work that we do um, in academia and other realms in terms of speculation? Do you have any thoughts on where they intersect, or should we just force them together, perhaps? <laughs> Well, I would love to, I would love it if the, uh, some portion of the protests could become charrettes, where here's the widest possible uh, cross-section of people in our community. You've got them together for a little bit of time. You know, that's an opportunity to use our design skills if we can get their attention and say, you've got the energy, you've got the motivation, come over here and let's, let's at least hear what you think the future should be like. I mean, I'll, I'll add, I mean, as you said in your introduction, Helen Maria, you know, all design is speculative. It's all future tense. And I think I, I, uh, I deeply believe that uh, we need to imagine the future to be able to build it, right? We need to see it first. We are, we're visual people, right? Um, and so uh, to be able to see it, uh, however speculatively, moves us on a trajectory, or at least allows us to say, is this the trajectory that we want to move towards? Um, and then we can build around that. And we can use that as has happened with utopian projects in the past, we can use that as a, as a gathering force and say, this is what we're moving towards, what's the part you can do? Um, and I, I just want to, you know, add as a secondary part, I think design needs to and can learn a lot from community organizing. And so to look at the way that we gather and collect and protest and move, you know, the needle and to, and to learn from that rather than to try to teach that. Uh, a lot of community organizing is about finding people where they already are, finding them where they already care, uh, reducing the thresholds of participation, meeting in a church instead of during office hours uh, so that mothers can attend with kids and et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, there's a lot we need to learn from community organizing 
uh, instead of leading. And it's the to the listening. We need to we need to uh, to learn to be more inclusive in the way that community organizing can teach us. Yeah, I would I would tend to agree um, about you know futures and and forecasting. Um, it needs to be a kind of uh, you know participatory sport, right? Where where everybody is uh, able to participate and have a voice, and we can uh, be much more inclusive. Um, so looking you know looking at some of the practices of participatory design and thinking about how those can be um, applied to these situations um, to get us thinking differently, imagining differently, um, not always imagining the worst possibility out of every uh, instance, but instead looking for how, um, how this can be a stepping stone to something better and potentially much better. Yeah, I would just I'd like to add something onto what Sarah said, and that is, it's not just the design is speculative. Most of business is speculative. Every time you see the word plan, strategic plan, hiring plan, revenue plan, it's that cone of the future. It's total speculation. If it says report, it's backward looking. If it says plan, it's forward looking. So those are all opportunities for us to then walk in and say, ha, I know how to deal with this. I can expand that cone. I can change the variables. We can change the outcome if we take this moment now to, to attach design thinking or use futures thinking for this little thing that we just write off because we do it so often. Any last words for us before I wrap this up? I think a lot of designers that are 2D designers were enamored by signs that didn't have a high degree of fidelity. They were undesigned signs. And I think to Sarah's point, there's so much that can be learned, not only through the authenticity, but the fidelity of community organizing. It's not superficial fidelity, it's organizational fidelity. And I think that's a great learning um, that I have from watching all the things that are happening right now. Fantastic. Well said. Um, well, maybe just to wrap up, um, I guess I want to say that um, as we launch the Futures Lab at CCA, our desire is to really to be discipline agnostic. You know, we want to look at all the tools, all the approaches from on the ground to, you know, to the Futures Tank Institutes. We want to engage students with them and we want to say, here's all the ways that you can think and all these tools are available for you to use. And we hope that you'll partner with us. You hope, we hope that you will come and help us. Uh, build out our resources and our website when it launches will be a place we hope for, of learning for everyone too we want to share as much as we are we're collecting with everyone else and um, so if i can just thank all of my panelists i am uh, thrilled that was such an exciting presentation and conversation i wish we could continue but we're out of time and thank you again sarah and kimberly and vince for hosting us as part of sf design week thank you Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Helen Maria. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.